Um, as way of background, the uh, however many quadrillion it is, to put it maybe in perspective, uh, maybe a little bit more easier to, to wrap your head around. Uh, between now and 2050, we have to produce as much food as we have cumulatively produced in the last 10,000 years on this planet. Right? right? So you take all the food produced on this planet over the last 10,000 years, you put it on one mountain, that's what we have to produce between now and 2050 to feed everybody on this planet. That's the task at hand, and I think that's what keeps us excited and uh, sometimes awake at night. Uh, also want to add a little bit on, uh, on Mike. We were joking last night. Uh, I do think, literally, Mike is the most watched executive, and his organization is the most watched organization in the whole agriculture uh, uh, industry, which still today represents 10% of consumer spending globally, 40% of global uh, employment is in agriculture and food, and this man and his organization are closer watched to drive change in this old industry than anybody else. And we'll get to that. Uh, the telecom uh, discussion was fascinating to me because there was so much analogy to, I think, Mike, what you are trying to do. Uh, but to jump in here, maybe stepping back a little bit, uh, agriculture has changed over the last 50 years dramatically, maybe starting with the days of the Green Revolution in the in the 70s, which was the first burst of technology all the way to the 2000s when the biotechnology revolution started. Maybe you just, and you were part of all of this, so maybe you give us a little bit of background. How do we actually got to where we are today? Sure. Let's, um, the way I look at it, there's been, th in the modern, in, since the, in the 1900s, uh, really a couple waves of innovation in agriculture. The first Norman Borlaug led the Green Revolution, which was really about how do we begin to think about breeding plants and breeding plants more effectively. And with that technology, um, you know, we saw increases in yields uh, globally. Uh, the 40s, 50s uh, time frame, if you go into the biotech and advanced breeding areas, you know, as we think about what went on, uh, research that was conducted in the 80s and began to get commercialized in the 90s that was coupling uh, a revolution in our ability to under understand DNA and sequence DNA cost-effectively uh, allowed us to think about how to breeding plants more effectively and uh, actually where we are today, breeding plants in computers as opposed to the field by understanding the genetics as well as biotechnology. And we saw significant increases again in uh, productivity uh, as those technologies have come on board. But as uh, you know, Mitch pointed out, uh, we're facing some enormous challenges. And if we were going to go ahead and meet some of the near-term trend lines, if we just look five years out in these trend lines around demand, just five years, into, forget looking out to 2050 right now, uh, what we're going to find is we're going to have to double uh, the rate of, of productivity or genetic gain that we're seeing in corn and quadruple it in, in soybeans compared to our historic baselines right now. And we're going to have to do that on, well, essentially uh, with about the same amount of land. The past five years, we've seen a lot of land come into production, most of that in South America. We're seeing uh, that that's slowing down dramatically. So going into the future, the last piece of this is what we're trying to do with the Climate Corporation. And I think this is the third wave of innovation in this, uh, in, in this modern era, and that's what I call the digital, or the green uh, uh, digital uh, ag re revolution. And um, that's what we're focused on. How can we begin to think about using data science? And a lot of the things you heard about AI and telecom and the connectivity is a huge piece of it, but the farm is digitizing. And it's digitizing because of all the things that we just heard about, right? And uh, we see this as a tremendous opportunity to go ahead and use advanced computational tools to help growers make better decisions about uh, their farms to improve yield, to improve productivity, to help them manage risk, and to be more sustainable in their operation. So um, we're on the cusp of a incredible uh, revolution in agriculture, and I believe it's going to be driven by data science and the digitization of the farm. So that's interesting. I think where uh, Mitch set us up here with the uh, marginal decrease of productivity or yield, which I think we probably agree is, is the biggest concern uh, for the industry that's going from 3% per year yield gains down to 1.2, which really is a bifocal world. It's really 0 0.6 or 7 for most crops in most geography, where the majority of the growth came from was the biotechnology revolution and yield growth in corn and soy. If you take that out, it's actually a much more dark picture. Yeah. 
So you, have a, you hold a belief that uh, big data analytics, digital agriculture, better decision, data-driven decision-making on farm will unlock this, will get us back onto a two plus percent year over year productivity gains, uh, gains in the industry? Yeah, let, let me frame it in uh, what the opportunity is and how, how we think about it. And uh, so first of all, a grower every fall will uh, uh, take their combine, if you're thinking about row crops, corn, soy, cotton, canola, wheat, It'll take their combine across their field and they'll see tremendous variability. And uh, you know, in the spring when they went ahead and planted that, that, that oh, let's use corn as an example, that corn field often it's planted with a single hybrid, it's fertilized uniformly and we can't control the weather. Um, yet at the end of the day they'll see shifts in yields, maybe one part of the field will be 150 bushels and another part of the field will be 250 bushels per acre. So the question is what's, what's causing that variability and how do you address that? The opportunity is this, and this is why um, I'm so excited about it. This is why we're investing so much in digital agriculture. Um, every year, the National Corn Growers Association in the United States has a yield contest. In the yield contest, uh, farmers go out, they buy a hybrid, and they plant this hybrid on 10 acres, and they highly manage that crop. Everyone has their own secret sauce of how they do it you know, for this contest. Uh, but last year, in 2016, the winner was 520 bushels per acre on, in a 10-acre plot. Yet, the, on 90 million acres of corn in the United States, the average yield was about 170 bushels. So a 300, you know, 300 bushels or so delta between the two. That's the opportunity. So the physiology of the corn plant is perfectly capable of producing 500 bushels per acre. Yet, it's all the variables that go into managing that crop and being able to do it on large scale that regresses that mean, that, that value down to the mean. And so, digital agriculture is about how can we help solve a very simple yet complicated equation. We say yield is a function of the genetics in the field, the environment that that genetics sees through the growing season, and how a farmer actually manages that field. G by E by farmer practice. And a grower will make 30, 40, 50 decisions every year around every field. And what we're doing using data science and being able to aggregate data and all the things you heard about in AI earlier today apply, can apply to agriculture as well is how can we deconvolute the interdependency of all those variables and help a grower then have better information to make decisions on how to manage their farm um, uh, in real time that's going to impact what's happening in the field this season to begin to change the risk profile and begin to allow us to reduce that variability and increase yields. This is the next opportunity. All the other things are going to be happening in the background, advanced breeding, new technologies, new crop protection, but digital ag is going to be a key to unlock that huge gap of uh, 300 bushels an acre in corn. It's the same thing for soybeans, slightly different numbers in wheat, all the major row crops have that same gap. So, so now we understand what the opportunity is, and you mentioned the 170 bushels or so average in the US, the global average is actually below 100 bushels. Correct. So yeah. uh, tremendous opportunity uh, at a global scale, of course, there as well. So the, what the opportunity here is, is relatively clear. The how to get there may not be quite as clear, and I think where some of the interesting analogy with the telecom discussion and so forth, uh, uh, come into play. Uh, there are many different moving parts and pieces to this. There is acquiring the data. There's some data out there in the public domain. Uh, there's a lot of on-farm data uh, that needs to be collected with different tools. Uh, there's something that needs to happen to the data. It needs to be analyzed in some way. Uh, it needs to uh, transformed into something that creates value for the grower and other stakeholders. It needs to get onto the farm and execute it and so forth. So a fairly complex environment that involves satellites, uh, micro infield soil sensors, uh, imaging, uh, machinery on the farm, uh, uh, mobility, all those kind of things. How do you think about this complex environment and how do you see where are some of the biggest value creation opportunities and how does what you do fit into that? Sure. Um, I always like to start with our customer. When you go out and you talk to a farmer and they'll tell you, um, I got all this data. I have 10 years of yield data and sitting on this spiral notebook in their machine shed on kind of a warped 
uh, shelf and it's collecting dust. I've got all this data and I have no useful information. It doesn't tell me anything. And so when you start at the base, the first thing is uh, growers are asking us, help me organize this data, put it all in one place, aggregate it for me, help me do some simple analytics so I can look at some cause and effect on my farm and make better decisions. So the first piece was, how do you get this farmer data in place? And uh, the way we, uh, we, we're accomplishing that is uh, through sensors on equipment and being able to go ahead and have a mechanism that every time a planter or a sprayer or a fertilizer or whatever implement is going through that field, that they are instrumented and, uh, and we're collecting data about what's going on, whether it be the planting density uh, geospatially referenced or how much fertilizer I put down. Or, uh, there's lots and lots of agricultural data being generated on the field. It all starts in the dirt. And so we've developed technology that makes it seamless for a grower to collect that data in real time directly from those implements uh, flow uh, into their account and directly into the cloud and it's organized and it's stored and now it's in a position that they can actually see it for the first time and visualize it and from that they can begin to understand some simple cause and effect. So that's the first piece and we call that farmer data uh, and there's a lot of information. I really like the, uh, the, um, uh, the AI piece, you know, you can apply um, artificial intelligence if you, you know, to a lot of data. What you want is tag data. You want data that has some sort of information that's tagged. And so if you think about it simply, a grower goes ahead and is going to plant. They pick a hybrid, so we know what the hybrid is through our technology. They plant it at a certain density. We know where and how they plant it in the field. And then ultimately they'll harvest it. So now we have that information and it's tagged. It's perfectly set up to aggregate that and begin to think about how you can uh, uh, extract information from that using artificial intelligence, and I'll get to that in a second. But So the first thing is just getting the data out of the field. And then what we're doing is we're bringing some other aspects to it, um, which uh, is unique. Um, genetics are really, really important. So we, one, one of the reasons in the industrial logic about, about Monsanto going out and spending a billion dollars to buy the Climate Corporation was we could bring a very unique and important data set into this equation. So we can understand what the farmer's doing on their farm, but we can also bring years and years of, of genetic information of how we've developed these products and, the, and how they interact in many, many different soil types and different environments, what their disease profile is, all the way down to the genetic le level. So that is information that's coming directly from um, our work and leveraging the work that's going on in Monsanto. And then there's this vast world of uh, publicly available data uh, and that varies country to country, but in the United States, um, there's 88 uh, Doppler radar stations set up across the Midwest, so we get, we get over 3 million data feeds a day. We use that information to begin to model weather, and so we can begin to look at cause and effect. These weather conditions occurred in your field at this time, and then we can track that and understand at harvest how we can begin to correlate weather to what's going on in the field. So again, uh, farmer data, and a simple way, and it's seamless for a grower, we, for them to collect their data now with the instruments we have on these implements, genetic data and research data coming directly out of Monsanto and, and other areas as well through partnerships and publicly available data. That's how we tackle the problem. That's how we amass the data set. And this is a massive, this is a big data problem. And it's a big data problem that there's no reason to believe that the technologies that we're using right now, and you heard about a little earlier, to solve specific business problems in other industries, why they will not work for agriculture. In fact, I think they have a much higher probability of being effective in agriculture. So it's a, uh, a pretty exciting opportunity. Interesting. There's a number of different groups and players here in this industry and acting, and uh, you have Monsanto, who has agronomic knowledge and expertise. Uh, you have uh, Climate Change with the acquisition, who has big data capabilities. Um, you have incumbent players like John Deere, who have in-field presence, data collection capabilities, and so forth. You have companies like Agrium or Winfield, who are very close to the grower, mm -hmm. have very good data on the grower. Um, you have uh, pure play data players like, like Google or IBM out there. You have delivery and analytics capabilities at Amazon. So you have incumbents and new players in this industry. How do you think about the playing field there? 
who will win, how will this uh, turn out? Well, it's, it's really early days um, in digital ag, and I think if you looked at investment, so when Monsanto purchased the Climate Corporation, it kind of really kicked off a, a venture capital investment spree in, it's, a lot of people call it, you know, uh, ag tech, and that's pretty broad because that also has to do with genetics. But if you take, in 2016, I think there was almost $5 billion invested, or 15 or 16, about $5 billion invested. About a billion of that was invested in what I would call more of the precision ag, digital ag space. And so a significant investment. You know, um, the, what we're trying to do with the Climate Corporation, again, it has a lot, I mean, we heard it in the telecom com conversation as well, is I think this is all about partnerships. And um, uh, how, do we, how do we bring technologies together on a platform? And so what we're doing at the Climate Corporation is we want to be the platform for agriculture. And so if you're a, if you're a, uh, a small startup, a drone company that wants to go ahead and provide you know, drone imagery to a grower, well, they have significant challenges. First of all, if you're a small company, you're going to have to get cloud computing, you're going to have accounts, you're going to have to have field boundaries, you're going to have all that infrastructure. Why not build on top of our infrastructure so you don't have to do that? And at the same time, most of the smaller companies don't have access to the grower. And as you said, you know, Agrium and Winfield and John Deere, if you know, if you follow us, we have deals with all of them. We have distribution deals. We have a great uh, we have a digital lag agreement with uh, with John Deere and other equipment companies, and so we have a conduit and distribution to a very selective and a, actually a relatively small number of folks that make a difference in agriculture. So um, our view is that we should partner. We should build a platform. We should allow innovation to flow from a lot of different innovators, whether that be a sensor company or a drone company. We can provide infrastructure, we can provide access to the grower, and perhaps most importantly, I'll use the drone example, if you're a drone company and I'm giving you an image of your field three times a year, in the absence of putting that image into context of everything else you're doing, all the way from planting to fertility to how you've gone ahead and managed your crop, uh, the weather in that field, it's not as valuable. So by developing these partnerships and a platform, not only can we draw innovation in from many other players and deliver it to the grower, but we can upgrade the value of that content because we can put it in, in, in context of everything else that's going on in the field, and it becomes another data layer under which we can apply our analytics engine to. So um, I think it's really early days, and I think it's gonna, things are going to, a, a lot of, of um, there's a lot to happen, but our, our strategy is uh, partner, and, and look for how we can bring more innovation to growers uh, on the FieldView platform. And, uh, and then there will be good natural winners and losers in that. So let me maybe ask you two more challenging questions. <laughs> One, how does the grower feel all about, about this? You started with a grower as it clearly has to be value added. There are privacy issues, there are data sharing concerns and so forth. Uh, that's question number one. And question number two is, how do you make money at this? Uh, which, which, which has been a question for a long yeah. uh, time in our industry around precision agriculture and big data. So if you want to tackle Sure, let me quickly. tackle those quickly because I think Mitch yeah. wants. Um, so from a, um, a customer perspective, um, you have to earn their trust. Growers, um, you, these, this, is not, this is something where you're, you're actually managing their livelihood. And a grower has 40 chances a year, 40 or 45 crops in their lifetime. I shouldn't say a year, 40 or 45 crops in their life, lifetime. So this is, this is about their livelihood. These are businesses. And so uh, we've been very, very clear with what our data policy is uh, to begin to build that trust. Grower owns their data. It's not ours. It's theirs, and they control it. We're going to, anything we do with it, we will completely inform them, and they need to give us consent. And three, if they don't want us to house their data anymore and they don't want us to work with their data, we will delete it from our system. And I'll tell you, that has gone a very long way. Now, the industry also has, with the uh, Farm Bureau Association, they've put guidelines in place, and uh, we've signed on, and all the big players in the industry has really signed on. So I feel pretty good that growers uh, understand our position, and we are in a position now, very early days, to build that trust. How do we make money? We make money by we create value for them. And we create value for them by helping them make better decisions on uh, how to manage their farm. And that ultimately is going to show up for them in productivity gain. So I can produce the same amount, but I'm going to have fewer inputs, direct yield improvements, help them manage risk. And uh, 
you know, I will say this, when we, when Monsanto started investing in biotechnology, that was in the early 80s, we launched our first product in 1996 and we became profitable in seeds and, techno and biotech around 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I anticipate this is gonna be a faster curve because of the nature of digital tools versus highly regulated biotechnology and breeding. But we also have to remember it's really early days here. So, uh, but I will say, I'll close that from a customer perspective, we're operating now in three continents, North America, South America, and in Europe. And I spend a lot of time talking with growers, and it is they are so receptive to this technology because they're looking for help and innovation on how to manage that variability that they have not been able to tackle simply by understanding independently what I plant and how I fertilize it and how I, how I treat crop protection and, and maybe micronutrients. And so that's the, that's the challenge and the opportunity for us to bring it all together. So we have we have actually have some great questions from the audience. So this isn't this doesn't mean to cut off the conversation. I think it's a, some interesting continuity. One of them that came from a number of people and is I think very very insightful is is this about technology and growing or is it about distribution? And right the the amount of waste from farm to table I've seen estimates of 40 percent so, something like that. If you think about that, if you could capture, obviously we'll never capture all of the 40%, but if we could capture a significant amount of it, um, how, you know, how, much, how far does that go to solving the issues? And is there, a pay, is there a path through some combination of better distribution and waste reduction that really speeds things up? So not, not just growing. Yeah. I. Um Absolutely, I think there's I think there's opportunities to improve in that. Uh, I I've seen a bunch of studies that would suggest that simply, you know, less waste or redistributing waste is not going to solve this problem. Uh, but I don't want to dismiss that because I think there's an, a, an awful lot that can still be done. And I think the way the other way to think about it, Mitch, is, you know. Ultimately, what we need to be doing, what I, I really, from a society perspective and from a climate perspective is, we have to figure out how to shrink the footprint of agriculture, okay? We need to figure out how to sustainably intensify it. So if we can, you know, regardless, that, that's really the goal. Can we figure out how not have to grow 90 million acres of corn in the United States, but can we figure out how to grow 45 million acres of corn in the United States and maintain the same, yeah, production or grow production on that. So ultimately, these are really, really tough problems to solve. These are big societal challenges as we look at the numbers. And I think there's going to be lots of solutions. I mean, it's not going to be just digital ag or just advanced breeding or biotechnology or organic farming or food waste. I think it's going to have to be all of them. So let's... So maybe let me... Oh, uh, go ahead. Because I, I completely agree with what Mike was saying. Um, look, there is, of course, opportunity by using data and analytics to drive efficiency through the entire chain, not just on the production side, but through the entire chain. But that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, there's 30% of uh, food production lost somewhere between when it comes out of the ground and when we put it in our mouth, or more importantly, throw it away. Now, where that waste happens is very different in developed versus developing countries. Mm -hmm. In our part of the world, just to be clear, the vast majority of it is the half-eaten half pizza, the yeah. yogurt, all the stuff that we as consumers throw away. Data is not going to help us with right. increasing prices may, but in the end those are choices and behavioral changes that as we know are very hard. Different in developing countries, they are actually, the loss is much more upstream, much more efficiency driven, but also requiring real hard infrastructure capex investments. Mm -hmm. Again, data will help somewhat, but more is required. Well, it's, the, the focus on data is great because I think it goes back to our a AI session where someone said that data is one of the most undervalued assets off, off, off people's balance sheets. But, uh, you know, Mike, just to go back to something you were just saying, because again, it comes up in a whole, whole, whole host of questions um, coming from the audience, and not that surprising. You know, they, the questions come three or four different ways, whether it's GMO, whether it's pesticides, right? People, people worry about, um, how we farm and what we're doing. And you use the term that I love, um, su sustainable intensification, um, which is great, 
great way to think about it. It's not just intensifying farming, but doing it on a sustainable basis. You know, can either of you sort of help help us understand, you know, pe you know, are pesticides bad? Are they decidedly bad? I assume Monsanto probably has a slightly, you know, different view of that than, than maybe some others. But is organic, is organic good? How do we sustainably intensify and sort of, you know, stick with the sustainable part of it? Sure. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll address that through the digital ag view because I think that's important. Um, I've talked about a corn crop, and we think about corn, and I'm, you know, clearly I've worked for Monsanto for 28 years, and so it's corn, it's biotechnology, it's GMOs, but the digitization of the farm is going to happen throughout oh, all of agriculture. These tools can be applied to vegetables, trees, nuts, vines, vegetables, animal agriculture. It's well beyond simply just is this a GMO question or is it a pesticide in the field question. Um, and ultimately, you know, the goal is how can we help growers be more efficient in production? And it, the digital tools are going, there's no reason, like I said, to believe that data science, software engineering, connectivity on the farm, sensors, and the ability to use advanced computational technology like AI, machine learning, deep learning, all the things we heard about today, isn't going to be able to substantially move the needle on sustainable intensification. And I would just say, we think about it much broader than just row crops. We're starting in row crops, but even, you know, again, the industrial logic, and we're public about this uh, in, when we talk about it. Hey, even if you just took Monsanto's global footprint of the, of the seeds we sell, it's 400 million acres of 2 billion acres of cultivated crops around the world. This is a much bigger opportunity than just biotech corn in the U.S. and South America. This is how can we really begin to transform the agricultural system globally. And that's, that's the opportunity. That's a lot of work to get there. But these tools can, can, can influence that. I mean, so Mitch, maybe two quick points. One, some of us in the room at least are old enough to uh, remember the Club of Rome uh, analysis and the doomsday analysis. We're going to run out of resources and all that, right? To some degree, part of the intensification and what we have been able to do on the technology side has actually helped us avoid that, right? So I think we should acknowledge that. Doomsday didn't come. We have produced enough feed, food for an increasing population over the last 50, 70 years. Um, and I think that has been hugely successful. I also completely agree from a sustainability point of view, back to Mike, the point that you made earlier, look, shrinking the footprint is, is paramount and the best thing we can do. Right? Well, unless the, that's foot, a little bit the, the, the footprint is already shrinking for itself, too. It is automatically shrinking with having less land and water available, but with technology, we can shrink the footprint further. And data analytics are going to be absolute critical, critical, critical to that. <coughs> Fertilizer nutrition is probably the most dramatic example, right? I mean, frankly, today, most farmers in the developed world and in countries like India are over fertilizing mm -hmm. by quite a bit because they're farming the average of the field. Fertilizer is relative cheap. So throwing more on than required is OK. With the tools that are being developed, you can be incredibly precise uh, and reduce the fertilizer amount by 20, 30, up to 50% uh, by, by applying it exactly where it's needed. That has going to have tremendous environmental benefits. So la last question from the audience. Climate change, um, you know, I gave those estimates before. Seems like, you know, uh, you know a pretty wild guess as far as I can tell. Where do we think it happens? Frankly, does warming ever actually help us grow more rather than grow less? You know, do we do we believe in climate change or global warming? Um, Remember, there are, there there are so, alternative facts. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, I'll go on record. I, I don't think there's uh, any. I don't think there's there should be any doubt that uh, there is there is climate change and the climate is warming. Uh, I think it will affect different regions uh, differently. I, in fact, I was, just, I, was, I was just at Harvard yesterday um, giving some lectures and I had a chance to meet with a scientist there who showed me data that I had not seen before about uh, mean temperature change in the Midwest, corn belt in the Midwest versus other regions. And if you actually look over the past 50 years, mean temperature changes in the Midwest have declined. 
So they've gotten cooler. And the reason his hypothesis is, is that plant density, how thickly we plant corn plants in the Midwest, has gone up dramatically, which is true. And there's a, there's a process called evapotranspiration where you take water from the soil, it goes up into the plant, and it evaporates through its leaves. And it's actually causing, because of the density, it's causing a cooling effect. It's a buffering effect. Now, I only bring that up is that it's very regional. And I, so it's hard to paint, a, and it's easy for a lot of people to paint a much broader picture. It's going to happen everywhere. This will be a much more challenging scientific problem from an agricultural perspective and a digital ag perspective because different regions will have different effects. But again, I flip it all the way around. I think data science and our, our ability to use uh, data science and uh, machine learning and those technologies in, in a big data at, uh, on a big data set will help us deconvolute some of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be challenging, but the tools are in place, and I think it's a very exciting time for agriculture. Well, look, let's, Mike, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. This was great. And I think I, I certainly learned a lot. I think we all did. Thanks for having me.